Thank you so much, Brother Case. I have been looking forward to being with you, and I am very thankful that my sweet wife is with me. Uh, I don't usually have her with me as I travel, but it's, it's been a, already a wonderful thing for her to be with me, to tell me whether my tie's straight or to, to help me, but also to sit beside her and sing. If any of you who were sitting there, my wife's a beautiful alto singer, and it's a very encouraging thing. I tell you, Stay is one of your elders, right? Did I, did I pronounce that right? Now, did you notice that last song, the very last word was stay? I thought that was very interesting. And then he got up and did a beautiful job right before the Lord's Supper. And I leaned over twice and told my wife, uh, quite often at home, when I, the few times I am home in Lineville, they'll ask me to preside over the Lord's table. And, and uh, I'm going to use some of that. that. That was, I thought, very meaningful, very thoughtful. Also, Jason, thank you so much for the songs. Uh, very beautiful songs that make us think. You know, I was told, though, that, uh, that I, I stopped four minutes early during Bible class. You're welcome. But uh, I did not mean to. I, I thought I was two minutes late. Uh, so I'm going to give you the last point of that lesson, okay? If you weren't here, we were talking about how important it is to uh, the two things that we can do to make the church grow. One, of course, is to study to teach and to preach the Word of God as it the Bible teaches. And the other thing is to visit. We didn't get to spend really enough time on that. So I'm going to tell you a true story. Brother Dale Smith knew a little woman by the name of Mabel. And he preached a beautiful sermon entitled, Maybe There's a Mabel. And I would like to relate the, the quickly the story that he told uh, about Mabel. True story. Many years ago, because I heard this example many years ago. Uh, in a very good part of town, a man and woman married and built them a house or bought them a house. But over the years, the man died and the woman who was still a faithful member of the church was in her 80s. And she now lived in the bad part of town. The inexpensive houses and sometimes the people who were not doing what's right lived close by. In fact, in my mind, to her left... The left of her house, the house is very close together, was a man and woman who were both alcoholics. And they had a beautiful little girl about seven years old. And the little girl's name was Mabel. And, uh, of course, the mother and father were not interested at all. But this little woman, faithful member of the church, went over and asked this little girl, who didn't have parents that really took care of her, to go and to go to her Bible classes that she still taught at 80 years of age. And she took that little girl by that little dirty hand. Maybe a little dirt around the fingernails. Her little dress maybe not as clean as some. Maybe even some of the members who saw her thought, I don't want my daughter to get close to her, you know, because she's dirty. But that little woman didn't care. And she took that little girl by the hand and took her in and told her those great Bible stories that you'll find in God's Word, the great Bible truths. About six or eight weeks later, the mother and father of that little girl moved away, and of course the little girl had to go too. Little Mabel was gone. Six or eight weeks was all that she had. And the little, the little lady next door waved by to them. Little Mabel at about 14 got married just to get away from her parents. By the time she was 19, she had two children. And her husband ran off with another woman. And you know what she said? You talk about planting seed. Yeah. Sister Seal, you're right. You've got to plant those seeds. You just keep planting them. That little girl sitting there crying, that little young lady, and she said, what am I going to do? And then she thought, where is that church? What was the name of that church? Of those people who that little woman taught me those great Bible stories. Only six or eight weeks. She said it was the Church of Christ. She called them, and they came and picked her up, and she went to service. Long story short, it wasn't long until she obeyed the gospel. It wasn't very long at all before she met a man. She had the right to remarry because her husband had cheated on her and run away with another woman. And, and she married this Christian man and began raising those children in the, in the right uh, way with God. Shortly, though, after they were married, they had to move away up north. No congregation there. They started one in their home. And the congregation grew, and they built a little building. And then they built a bigger building. And then they helped start another congregation in some nearby towns. And then they had to move again. And her and her husband helped start another congregation. And Dale said, 
you know, that little woman, he was holding Mabel's hand when she died. But she and her husband had been instrumental in helping to start 57 congregations in the north. 57. True story. And then he said this. He said, a long time ago, before that, a long time before that, there was an old woman that lived in the bad part of town that didn't even know what she was about to do by taking a little girl's hand and taking her to that Bible class. And she closed her eyes long ago, never knowing what she would do. And you know, maybe there's a Mabel in your life too and in my life that we can teach and help and change the world. Does it need some changing? Does America need some changing? Yes, it does. Maybe you can be one that helps accomplish that, that truth. Now let's start with the, this morning's lesson. I got my timer going over here. Uh, you know, I've got to look at it. I realize that. But uh, I've been trying to do that. I've been trying to keep my lessons to uh, less than two hours. So <laughs> uh, I have a little flyer here that someone put out and it says, how can I be happy living in a messed up world? Philippians 4, 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord again. I say rejoice. You know who wrote that? Paul wrote that. He wrote that while he was in prison, most people would say. History would have it. How could he say that? And I, I went to a youth rally years ago where they were talking about rejoicing in the Lord. That, that this was what made the difference. That they rejoiced in the Lord. And one speaker got up and he said, because uh, I forgot, 30, I think 30 something times, it's according to the translation you use, that it uses the word joy, rejoice, or rejoicing. And he got up and he said, do you know why Paul was able to say that while he was in prison? Because almost 60 times in that short book, letter, it says Jesus, Christ, Lord, Savior, Jesus is what made Paul be able to say those things. When Paul and Silas were in prison, they had been beaten and their hands and feet were in stocks. And at midnight they were singing praises to God, the old King James says. They were singing praises to God. Why, how could they sing praises? It says, and the other prisoners heard them. You know, they were planting seeds in the minds of those people. Just like Jesus, as he hung on the cross, was still planting the seed in the mind of these soldiers by the people that stood around. And finally, he converted one of those, soldiers, or one of those prisoners, didn't he? One of those men that hung beside him. Looking for a way to preach and to teach is what we've got to do. But who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus that we serve? Well, when I was a little boy, I appreciate the reading. You did a good job. Case. And uh, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, what kind of mind did Jesus have? Most of us study, we study about the birth of poor baby Jesus. When I was a little boy, they used to read that and, and say Jesus was born in a manger. And you know, we had two cows. Two cows. Well, milk cow, two milk cows. And we had this little feed trough about this long with a V bottom in it. And I remember thinking, poor little Jesus, he was laying in there in, in a little feed trough. You know, I wasn't thinking about it being a big barn with a, a, a big feed trough. I was thinking about that little bitty, that's just a little boy, you know. And later on I realized it was probably a bigger trough, to, big enough to make a little bed out of, put some hay in. But you know, I thought, poor baby Jesus. And that's what everybody, you know, they tried to kill him when he was little. Somewhere in the range of two. They, they tried so hard they killed a lot of other babies trying to kill him. God didn't like that. He never has and never will like people who kill babies. He just don't like it. He loves you, but he don't like it. Poor Jesus. And then you know what? We skip the life of Jesus, most people, and they go straight to the crucifixion of Jesus. Poor Jesus. Nobody loved him. They scourged him, put a crown of thorns on his head and beat him and hung him on the cross, made him carry his own cross, and he died. Now, we can't do either one of those two things. For one thing, we've already been born. Most of us, I imagine, born in a hospital. Some may be in a car on the way to the hospital. And that's too late. We, we can't be born like Jesus in a barn. And we can't die like Jesus on a cross. And the Lord never expected us to. In fact, Jesus took our place so we wouldn't have to. The Lord wants us. 
He wants us to live like him. I have a passage here from uh, John chapter 14 verses uh, 8 and 9. And let's read together. It says here, Philip said to him, you know, they've been talking about this. And Philip came up to him and said, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. That's old King James English for saying, we'll be satisfied. Just show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, have I been so long time with you and yet you have not known me? You see, Jesus is the Son of God or the God's Son. In John chapter 1, those first verses, he says, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was and is God. And listen, it's, it's sad to me that most people are proud of a lot of things. And now today I know there's uh, there little boys and uh, maybe even some of the little girls, I guess, have these superheroes. When I was a kid, we had Superman. That's about it. <laughs> maybe Batman. But you know what my brother and I would do? We would go into my mama's uh, scarf drawer when she wasn't looking. And we'd get a scarf, one of them little ones that flow, and we'd put it around her neck and tie it. And we'd stand out there on the porch. Our porch was about probably about from here down to the floor down there off the ground. And we'd stand up there and we'd throw one hand up in there and we'd jump off so that the little thing would flow behind her back. And we'd say, Superman! Now why did we do that? Because we thought of Superman as a hero. Superman was strong. He was powerful. He cared for the needy. He helped people that were poor. He helped people that were in difficult. He stopped the crimes. You know, we did it because we thought he was powerful. Oh, I know today you got Batman and Spider-Man and uh, Batwoman and I don't know, you got a Spider-Woman. I don't know. They got all kind of superheroes and none of them are real. But this character, Jesus, is real. But I mean, how many people are really proud to say, I'm a Christian? You know, a lot of times young people at school and some people at work, somebody will say, yeah, well, why, where were you yesterday? I called you to see if you want to go fishing with me. Or well, we went down to the park and played ball. Where were you? Some people kind of do it this way. They say, well, I was in church. You where? In church. What? I went to church. Oh, did you go to Bible class? Listen, people can tell when we're ashamed of something. And if you're ashamed of it, people are going to make fun of you. And if you're not, when you can look them square in the eye and say, Oh man, I went to church. I went to worship God and I went to Bible class and we sang. You ought to go with us. It was great. They can see it in your eyes. But see, a lot of people are not proud of who Jesus is because they don't know who he is and who he was. They just don't know him. Uh, Years ago, we were picking up kids for vacation Bible school. We uh, started this congregation, and a deacon came up to... Well, I know he wasn't a deacon then, but he was deacon later. He was the guy in charge of ordering Bible class material for vacation Bible school. And he said, that's my first year. You know, we hadn't been there long. And he said, how many of you think we're going to have at Bible class, John? Yeah, I said, uh, I mean, uh, vacation Bible school. I said, uh, 150. He looked at me and laughed. He said, we had never had over 75. He said, I've just got to order some Bible class. I said, we're going to have 150. I thought, challenge accepted, my friend. I went and borrowed me a school bus back when you could just barely have your license and drive a school bus. I know it wasn't good, but it's true. And I borrowed a school bus. And we picked up people on Wednesday with 151. You know how much Bible class material he ordered? 75. You know how much Bible class material he ordered after that when I told him to order it? Whatever I said. <laughs> but you know... Uh, I was riding on that bus and there was this beautiful little seven or eight year old girl, pretty little thing with pigtails and, and she, she was singing a little song. It was something like this. It said, I wish I had a little red box to put my Jesus in. I'd take him out and, and share him with a friend. Oh, it's so sweet. And right in the middle of that song, she was singing every day, you know, right in the middle of that song one day, I wish I had a little red box to put my Jesus in. A boy pulled her hair from behind the next seat. She turned around and cussed him up one side and down the other. <laughs> now, cussed, in case you're from up north, that's cursed, okay? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of funny, but it's kind of sad because she knew Jesus' name. She wanted to kiss him, but she really didn't know who he was, enough for it to change her life. I know she was just seven, but you know, some of us are 70. Has Jesus changed our life or do we really not know who he is? 
Let's look at some verses about that for a few minutes, okay? And I'm going to get off my notes, and I'm going to get really way out there in the tangent if I'm not careful. What was Jesus really like? First of all, you've got to understand he was real. He was really a child. You know, we read that in the New Testament. We, we only read that he was born. We get, get him up to about two when they escaped to Egypt and came back. And then in Luke chapter 2, uh, we read about a trip that he went on with his parents when he was about 12 years old. So Jesus was real. He was a real person. He was a real person who walked those sandy and rocky roads and who, who had all kind of things happen to him just like happens to a regular person. A friend of mine many years ago in college said he asked the kids, you suppose Jesus ever stubbed his toe? And one of the kids said, well, I guess he did. You know, where you, I don't know if any of you go barefooted when you were a kid, but sometimes you'd go barefooted and you'd hit that rock just right and he'd tear that part of that toenail off, you know. And he said, what do you, he asked the kids, what do you think Jesus might have said? You know, most of us think Jesus would say, Hallelujah! God bless me, you know. <laughs> he said, now I don't believe this is what Jesus said, but this is what the kid, the child said in his Bible class. said, he, he might have looked at it, that rock and said, I knew I should have turned you into bread when I had the chance. <laughs> I thought, no, no, probably not. But, but you know, he probably did say, Ouch! Oh, that hurts. Oh, man. And he might have kicked the rock with his other foot out of the way and might have hurt that foot too. You know, you've done it. Because Jesus was real. He did feel, he did feel pain. He did have problems. In Mark chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Jesus was a carpenter. He worked with his father. The people knew him as a carpenter. They said, is not this the carpenter? Jesus worked with his parents. Historical records prove that he existed uh, the works of Josephus and many other people. Have you ever seen the full works of Josephus in book form? That book's about that thick. And he talks about Jesus. And of course, historically, we know that Jesus lives. Now, there's lots of people that, uh, that may not believe in Jesus anymore, but every one of them still put the date on their check based upon when Jesus came onto the scene in this world. They still do that. Every newspaper and every uh, online newspaper that puts a date up at the top says, Jesus was born back then, this, this date, that many years ago. Oh, I know you have to calculate the missed day or two, but the truth is all of it still is talking about the birth of Jesus. Of course, the biblical record proves that he existed too. It tells us over and over and over that he was the son of God, the Bible record. You know, young people, you want to know how to live as a child? The Lord doesn't spend as much time as us preachers do sometimes putting something down. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. After Jesus had been found in Jerusalem, after he had gone out there and, and, and his parents had gotten, they let him get lost. Parents, you ever lose a child? It's a terrible feeling. I remember one time I, my little boy was asleep on the pew at, uh, at the church building and I I was talking, I talked till just about everybody's gone and usually till everybody's gone. In fact, on a vacation one time, I was uh, talking with the preacher on a Wednesday night and he said, well, listen, we love having y'all. We talked for about 30 minutes. He said, I'm going to have to go. I said, okay, you be careful. And I waved as he drove out and I turned around. We're the only ones in the parking lot. Went to another congregation where we like to go down in uh, South Alabama and we go there every time we're there. And one woman came up to me after several years and said, uh, sir, uh, Listen, I'm going to have to leave, and I notice when you visit, you're always here toward the end. Would you mind locking the front door? So I became the door locker. And, uh, but uh, actually, uh, I left that little boy of mine at the church building afterwards. He was asleep on that pew, and I went to the devotional. Thanks for, thankfully, he's only a few blocks away from the church building. And my wife said, where's our baby? <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, you don't have him? I ran back out to the car. About that time, one of the elders drove up because I think he had been counting the, uh, the money that had come in for the collection that night. And he said, you lose something? <laughs> you know, I know Jesus' parents were very, very worried. But they found Jesus. They went back to Jerusalem. Somebody says, how could they lose him? Well, you know, the kids, they didn't go on a bus. You know, they, they went down the trail in groups together for, to keep the marauders from, uh, from getting them. And, uh, 
you know, because the people would hide behind the bushes and jump out and get you. I still remember my wife coming out of class one time laughing. She said she was putting on a little flannel graph about how the, the person was coming around the rocks and the marauders were hiding behind the rocks. And one of the little girls said, watch out, <laughs> they're behind that rock. <laughs> and so, you know, they had to look out for one another. That's what they did. And, uh, and so... They're in groups, and the kids go out here and play. Because, you know, the kids, if you notice, they can just run around and around in circles. It, ten times how much you run, and you're tired, and they're not tired. And it's sort of like I read in the Reader's Digest the other, other day. This woman said, raising kids is kind of like juggling three balls that are screaming at you the whole time. <laughs> I thought, man, sort of. And uh, the one who can do more than three, is <laughs> they just get screaming louder and louder. But they were out there playing, and they thought they were in the crowd. And, you know, those Jewish kids, I'm sure, all look alike, especially with those little turbans and things on. And finally, when they called them in at the end of the day, Jesus wasn't there. And they, they were worried sick, and they, they went back uh, to, to find Jesus. They found him, and he was in the temple asking questions and answering questions. Uh, and uh, when his mother asked, honey, why did you do this? You knew we were looking for you. We were sorrowing and we were looking for you. And he said, but mother, didn't you know I would be about my father's business? Basically, he wasn't being disrespectful to his mother. He was saying, he basically was saying, you should have looked here first. You know I would have come to the temple. Evidently, when they came to the temple, he had a lot of interest in that temple. He said, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? And, uh, but I like verse 52. Because that's where it tells us that he went down and he was subject to his parents. That means, kids, subject means he was obedient. You know, we use the word submarine. Submarine is something that goes under the water. Subjection means you put yourself under someone else. And Jesus was subject to his parents. He obeyed them. And then it says he grew in three different ways, actually four. It says he grew in stature. That means size. He grew in wisdom. That means smarts and the ability to apply the smarts. And he grew in favor. Favor means popularity with God and man. You know, what? Jesus wasn't popular. You know, he was born in a manger and they killed him on the cross. Yeah, but in a few minutes you're going to find out he was very popular while he was here on the earth teaching and helping people. Jesus was a great man of power. Jesus... Like I said, we only think of him as, uh, as being a, a poor savior who came and died. But Jesus was a real man. He worked with his father as a carpenter in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Have you ever seen a, a carpenter that was weak? Anybody a carpenter? Raise your hand if you're a carpenter out there. Anybody a carpenter or a cabinet builder? I'm a cabinet builder by trade, but of the last 16 or 17 years, I've been doing uh, mission work during that period of time when I used to do the cabinet work. And now I find myself, my hands are getting real thin. <laughs> My father was a cabinet builder. He was six foot four, weighed 245 pounds when he was 45 years old. And he, I've seen him cut his hand pretty deep and it not even bleed. I've seen him cut himself and say, uh, oh, it didn't cut all the way through. <laughs> he was tough. When he was 87, he had already lost in height. You know how you do. He had lost down to only six, three and three quarters. And he weighed 269 pounds. And somebody said, what do they call your daddy, John? I said, most people still call him sir. <laughs> so I, I think of a carpenter, I think of my father. And I think of other carpenters. I've seen some little carpenters, those crony ones. And you'll shake their hand, it's like shaking hands with a crab or something. Their hand is just so tough. Now Jesus was a carpenter. He knew how to work. He worked with his father. When Jesus spoke... People stopped and listened. Where Jesus went, people followed him. On one occasion, you know, 3,000 people, 4,000 people, 5,000 people followed him. When 5,000 people followed him, one time they followed him for three days with nothing to eat. Are y'all going to stay up here and listen to me for three days before you eat anything? Huh? You say, well, hey, some of you might think, you know, he's kind of interesting to listen to you because you don't have to hear me all the time. Okay, so that's the situation. But you're not going to, when it comes lunchtime, I already had somebody tell me, he said, when it comes lunch, you can preach as long as you want, but now we're leaving when it comes time for, for lunch. But Jesus was the kind of person that people wanted to hear what he had to say.
You know, we, we, he always had people, he showed his power also in the way he dealt with people. Now, if we're going to be like Jesus, we need to read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we need to find out what Jesus was like and how he handled the situations. You know, we, we think quite often, young people quite often think that they're supposed to just be real timid. And, you know, they're just supposed to kind of tuck their head like this. Do you know, that's not what Jesus taught. Jesus handled the situations when they tried to trick him. Now, I'm not talking about you, you know, putting some spikes on your Bible and being ready so that if somebody comes up to you and starts smart mathing you about being a Christian, I'm going to pop you upside that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Jesus handled things with his words. And in fact, we were in a Bible class about this, and I was talking to the kids. You know, there used to be a thing called just say no to drugs. You remember that? Just say no. That's not enough. You got to do more than that. <laughs> you got to be ready. You got to be ready to say something. So I told the kids, I said, you need to think about what you're saying when somebody try, offers you a cigarette. You got to say something like, like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to die. I don't want to get to where I can't breathe. I don't want my fingers to turn yellow. I don't want to stink. I don't want my hair to smell like cigarettes. You know, you got to come up with something. Not no, because when you say no, you're saying I'm just a weak little boy and you're a strong, powerful person because you're smoking. And it's not that way. It's just not. Or here, you want a beer? I had one young person tell me, he said, I took the beer and put it to my mouth, John, but I didn't open my mouth. But I didn't want them to think I was a coward. You know, we've got to get to the point that we can do what Jesus did. And we've got to stand up and do what's right. Uh, I'll never forget a young man named Matthew. We were talking about this in Bible class. I said, Matthew was always really quiet, but he was big. <clears throat> and I said, Matthew, what would you do if someone tried to get you to drink a beer? He said, God's sake, I'm not going to drink for you or anybody. And I went, yeah, that'd probably work. <laughs> but you know, I'm not saying that you have to be mean and ugly to people, but what are you going to say? What do you say when the temptations come? In just a little while after we eat, we're going to talk about how to deal with the devil. Today, right now, we're talking about how great Jesus is. We're going to talk about how to deal with the devil. And we've got to know what Jesus is like in order to do that. I hate to have to stop talking to take a drink of water. Jesus showed his great power in the synagogue in Matthew chapter 12, 12 through 16. He went into the synagogue and they were out there. They were supposed to be helping the people that came in to, to sacrifice to God. They ha would have a booth set up and they would have this place where they would have an inspector who would inspect your sheep to see if it was good enough to offer to Jesus. And some little old lady might come in there with the most beautiful little sheep that she just kind of halfway loved. Spotless. And they would say, oh, no, no, that's not good enough. That's not good enough for, G for God. You'll have to go to the market and sell that. Or, or we'll buy it from you and pay you just a little bit. And then you can go buy one of our official ones over here in this pen. And as soon as she left, they'd take hers and put it in the official pen. They were crooks. Now, if someone came from Egypt, they had better gold in Egypt. Higher quality of gold. And the exchanger said, oh no, we, don't, we can't take that gold. It has to be our kind of gold. And so you'll have to trade that in and get our kind of gold for it. And they'd, they'd split it in half. They would keep half the money and only give them half of what it was worth. And Jesus came in there and he was filled with rage. Did you know Christians ought to be filled with rage? The Bible does not say, don't be angry. There are a lot of people that think they shouldn't be angry. But you know, I've had people ask me, how do, I, how do I love my enemy, John? How can a person love their enemy? Well, you've got to give yourself these three things, okay? Number one, you've got to let yourself be angry. If they did something really bad to you and you're not angry, there's something wrong with you. But it says be angry and sin not. Now, the second thing you do is you find something good to do for them, Matthew chapter 5. Do something good for them. And the third one is, when you can get to the point that you look off your cross, whatever they put you on, and look down on them and feel sorry for them. Aren't you sorry for anybody that may go to hell because of what they've done to you? Don't you feel sorry for that person? You can't hate somebody you feel sorry for. But Jesus went in and he was angry and had a right to be angry. He, he made a little, a, a small, it said, scourge, a little whip. I, I, I believe to run those little animals out of there. And he didn't just go in there and say, get out. He said, get out. And he turned their tables over. And you know what those men did? They got out of there. When Jesus told somebody to do something, they did it. That's who he was. He was the Son of God. He was the, he's had power. 
the Pharisees tried to trick him. They said in, in Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, I'm running out of time, so we're going to have to hurry. Uh, so you'll have to read this on your own. Write it down, Matthew 15, 1 through 11. I'll tell you what you need to do. Look here. I want to show you something. Look, this is uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John right here. And this is the rest of the New Testament right here. Right there. Almost half of the New Testament. At least a third of the New Testament is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you know what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John specifically talks about? Not that the rest of the Bible doesn't have anything to say about him. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is called the gospel. That's the good news. The good news of who? The good news of Jesus and what he did and how he provided salvation for us. So you know what? All of us need to go and read it ourselves. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you know what we need to do? We need to read it again. And pretty so soon, it'll be echoing in our head how Jesus handled situations. Somebody said, well, situations are different today. Yeah, they are, but they're the same as well. As far as how to handle those situations. Jesus had disbelievers. Jesus had people with, that were sick. Jesus had people that were uh, scorners. Jesus had people that wanted to hurt him. You, you know, today we have all of those things. And Jesus knew how to handle it. In Matthew 5, uh, 15, 1 through 11, though, they came and said, Why do you transgress our traditions by not washing your hands before you eat? And finally, Jesus gave a, several good examples about how they didn't obey the rest of the law either. Then at the last, he says, You misunderstand. It's not what goes in a man's mouth that defiles him, but what comes out of a man, out of a man's heart that defiles him and says who he is. Jesus shut their mouths. In uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 15, they came to him and said, they came up to him and said, Master, great teacher, we have a question to ask you. And it said they were doing it to try to trick him with his words. They said, do we pay tax? We know you don't regard any man. You don't put anybody above anybody else. So do we pay taxes to Caesars or no? Well, see, if Jesus said no, the tax collectors would come get him and they'd execute him for that. Encouraging people not to pay their taxes. But if he said yes, then the people that have been following him are not going to want to follow him anymore because they're having to pay taxes under duress. That country had been taken over by the Romans. So you know what Jesus did? He didn't answer their question. He said, anybody have a coin? Boy, I can hear them digging around in their little bags for a coin. He says, hand it to me. They handed it to him. He held it up and says, whose image and superscription is on this coin? And they said, Caesar. I don't know that Jesus did this, but in my mind, I can see Jesus flipping the coin back to him. And while it's in the air, he says, you give to Caesar what's Caesar, you give to God what's God. And you know what the crowds did? The crowds cheer. Over and over again, Jesus tricked them. My favorite account is John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, because it shows Jesus' mercy and his kindness. And I'd love to turn and just read the whole thing. I have it here, but... But I'm just going to tell you very briefly. They caught a woman in the very act of adultery. Look at their trickery. They're under Roman bondage. And under Roman society, sadly, it's much like America today. You can sleep with anybody you want, whether you're married or not married. And it's just fine as far as they're concerned. Look what happened to Rome. Jewish law says if someone is convicted of sleeping with somebody that's not their mate, they are to be tied to the ground. Now, this is after a trial. They're to be tied to the ground, hands and feet. And then, starting with the avenger of blood, which would be the one that, one that they wronged, is supposed, you're supposed to lay a rock on their chest. And then another person from the community lays a rock and lays a rock and lays a rock until they black out. It was, it was actually a pretty merciful way to die. Scary, I'm sure, but merciful. But you say, well, I thought they threw the rocks. Well, when they did that, it was a lynch mob. That's what you find in the book of Acts when Stephen was stoned. A lynch mob. But they bring this woman in. By the way, it's supposed to be the man and the woman. But they bring this woman in and they stand her there in the middle. And here she is. I'm, I'm thinking maybe nothing more than a big sheet wrapped around her. Maybe tears rolling down her face. And they come up to him and said, Great Master, Moses says we're supposed to kill this woman. What say you? You know what Jesus did? He stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he heard him not. And there's one little verse in there that's very interesting. It says, he said, it says, they continue to ask him. You know how people do when they're trying to get you to do wrong. Come on. I can just hear those guys, can't you? I don't know exactly what it said. The Bible often sums it up much quicker than us preachers. But he said, it says that they continue to ask him. I can just hear them saying, 
Come on, Jesus. You're the one that's the Son of God. You got all the right answers. We got you this time, Jesus. What do we do, Jesus? Finally, Jesus stood up. You know, I, can you see their toes sticking out of those sandals? You know, are, are your toes happy sometimes? You know, they're kind of patting around like they're happy. I can just see Jesus down there writing, and all he can see is their toes. One woman told me, said, I'll never be happy till I know what he wrote. Well, you're going to have to go to heaven so you can ask Jesus, and then he may not tell you. <laughs> I think he was just doodling. <laughs> or maybe writing one of the Ten Commandments. But, but anyway, so they had those happy toes. You know how you do when you know you're right and you're patting that foot? You know how you women do when you know you're right and your husband's wrong? Which is most of the time right. <laughs> but anyway, finally Jesus stood up and he looked at all of them. And he said... Let the man that has no sins cast the first stone. Then you know what he did, guys? He stooped back down. Didn't even look at them. And you know what? I can see them old toes and those sandals kind of drawing up in there. You know, like you do when you, when you drop your, your, your sledgehammer or something and your toes draw up in your shoes because you're afraid it's going to hit you. And Jesus had told those guys the true answer. And, they drew it. and then he, he started looking at those old toes with the funny toenails and the bent toes. The older guys, they left first. Because they were convicted of their sins first. And finally, all of them were gone. And Jesus stood up and that woman standing there, maybe with a little tears cutting through the dirt, maybe that was on her face from the dust of the crowd leaving. And Jesus looked at her and said, Does no man condemn you? And she said, No man, Lord. And he said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You see, Jesus came to help us. He came to save us. He came to care for us. And we've forgotten who Jesus is. We've forgotten what we have because we know Jesus. Okay, I've got a letter here. Over 40 years old. This little girl, her name was Tony. We were knocking doors for a gospel meeting and we... We had gone to the park and we had met some people. You know how teenagers are, they're not afraid of anything. And they went up to this gang of people. They had knives on their side. They have pock marks in their arms where they'd shot drugs. They had tattoos. They had things in their lip and eyebrows. And they went up and invited them to come. And all of us adults were going, what? Well, they, they didn't come to the gospel meeting that night. But the devotional for the young people afterwards, they all came in. And here was that Tony girl. They came up and sat down. And list, she listened. I could tell she was listening. The next night, she came to the gospel meeting. She came to the devotional. She, the others never came back. Toward the end of that week, she was baptized into Christ. Then she came up to me and she said, John, <clears throat> I need to go with you to the police station. I said, why, Tony? She said, because part of my repentance is to do what's right. And she said, me and my friend stole a car and destroyed it. And I want to go and turn myself in. We went to the police station. They took her belt, her shoelaces. And from behind bars, she looked at me and smiled like she was free for the first time. And she wrote me this letter. I'm just going to read a little part of it, okay? She said, I used to think I had it all till I met you guys. She, they're from up a little farther north than us. She used to think she had it all. Her knife and her tattoos and her drugs and her metal in her brows. I used to think it I had it all till I met you guys. But you guys have the greatest thing of all. You hold the world in your hands. And it is true. We hold the world in our hands. If we can only understand who Jesus really is, then we're going to be proud. <coughs> we're going to be proud to say, I'm a Christian. Jesus Christ the Lord is my Savior. Let me tell you about him. Now, I mean, we don't just run up on the street and tell somebody that, but when somebody says, why are you the way you are? I remember Ricky came up to me. He was a football player, pretty cool dude, you know, and I mean, he was tough. And one day we we're walking out to PE, and as he passed me, he looked back behind him and looked in front to make sure the other people were ahead of us, and he said, I wish I could be like you and not curse. Then he just went on. By the way, he ended up being one of those 20 or 25 young people sitting on the front there. The first person that I ever taught the gospel to. You know? 
Listen, we've got to let people know we got something. If you're a Christian, you've got something. If you're not a Christian, you're missing something. You're missing something that's great, and you're missing the blessings of being in Christ. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, the reason Jesus did not heal all the sick, the reason He did not feed all the hungry, is because that's not what He came to do. He could have done it. He could have done it by doing that. He could have done it by winking one eye. But that's not why He came. He came to seek and to save the lost, which all of us are either lost or were lost. But we've been saved by the blood of Jesus. I got one more letter, and the sermon's going to be yours. This letter is from a, a young man. I went to camp when I was about 22, I guess, up in Idaho. And there was this young man there. He had muscles, girls, um, teenage girls. He was 16. Boy, he had muscles sticking out everywhere, you know. And they had separate swim times for the boys and the girls. And, and uh, Scott was this boy's name. And uh, he was having a good time. He had a lot of followers. <laughs> Not the same way you do today. They, I mean, they literally followed him. The girls did. We got talking about who Jesus was and how that some people think of Jesus with little letters. Little Jesus. And before that week was over, that boy was converted. Yeah, he was, had been baptized before. But he was converted to who Jesus really was. He got home and he wrote me this letter. I, I've got his address there. I'm thinking about calling and see if uh, he's in a nursing home or something now. I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, he wrote this in the middle of this letter. He said, I really used to be frustrated because little Jesus just didn't seem to be enough for me. You know, that's what a lot of people, why people aren't happy with Christianity. A lot of them are thinking of little Jesus. They're not thinking of who Jesus really is. You listen, it's in here. You read about what he did. You know, one time some soldiers came to get Jesus. This was before it was time for him to be arrested. And they came back. Soldiers I'm talking about. They came back without him. And the scribes and Pharisees said, why, why didn't you bring him? And they said, we never heard anybody talk like him. What? Soldiers that wouldn't arrest somebody because of the way he talked? Jesus was a powerhouse. A loving, kind care who, when they didn't want the children to come to him, he said, no, 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 allow the children to come unto me and, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he picked those little babies up and played with them. I saw the prettiest little darker skin than me baby in the hotel this morning. I talked with her and she made a scrunchy face for me and her mother tried to get her to, but finally she got her to tell me bye-bye. You know, he loved those little children. And if you don't love children, there's something wrong with you. Okay? You may not love to have them all the time. That's one thing about, wonderful thing about grandchildren. You can send them back home after a while, you know. But, but it's wonderful to have them with you. But he said, this little Jesus just didn't seem to be enough for me. And I, I couldn't find anything that kept me satisfied. You never will. You never will. I, I like what uh, Sister Seal said to me a while ago. I, I said the thing about the little lady that came in. If you weren't here in Bible class, you should have been here. But anyway, she came into Bible class uh, to the congregation where I was, an older lady, and she said something about she had spent the night with old Arthur, old Arthur Ritus. And then I said, later on, I went back and she had passed away and she was gone. And that, Sister Seal said, yeah, and she didn't take Arthur with her either. That's a good point. See, Jesus came to seek and save us because all of us are going to be unsatisfied without Jesus. I'm telling you, you are. If you're not a faithful Christian, you're not satisfied. You go to bed at night in fear. You go to bed at night thinking about the bad things. Or you've done so many bad things that you don't think about it much anymore. Start thinking about it. Because your only hope is Jesus. But I, you can probably see it from there. But he said, but now that Jesus Christ, all capital letters, is coming to my life, he said, I said, I'm going to read it for you. He said, that you talked about and got me talking about. said, it's just too much. This was back in hippie days, I know. This was just too much. He said, I baptized six. A 16-year-old. And I'm working on number seven and eight. And the only trouble I've gotten into is that we had more than we could fit in our station wagon last Sunday. Don't think you're too young if you're a Christian to do something. Don't think you're too old if you're a Christian to do something. Don't think that somebody else is going to do it. Live for God because Jesus is the hope that all of us have. And Jesus Christ is the power that all of us have. The greatest temptation that we're gonna, ever going to have and the biggest decision that we're going to make is are we going to follow Jesus or are we not? I mentioned earlier the plan of salvation that God gave us. It's a real simple thing. God gave us a Bible. 
This is it. This is it. God gave us a Bible. And in it we read and we study and we hear His Word. If you believe there's a God and believe He gave the Bible and, and you believe the, the words that are in it, then you're going to be willing to hear it. And when you believe it, you're going to change. And when you change, you're going to confess that you believe in Jesus. When you confess that you believe in Jesus, you're still going to want your life straightened out. So you're going to go, as we said this morning, to Romans 6, 3 through 5, Acts 2, 38, Galatians 3, 27, which says the last step before we get into Jesus who saves you is baptism. Somebody told me one time, since Jesus died for us, couldn't he have saved us any way he wanted to? Yes, he could, and he did. He did. He told us to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Hear his word, believe it, repent, confess, and be baptized. And we do that, and Jesus' grace is what saves us. If you're not a Christian today, you're missing out on the great things of Jesus. And I know you want it. Deep down, I know you want it. If we can help you in any way, if you want to study the Bible this week, I'll come study with you. Uh, uh, Case will come study with you. The elders will come study with you. We want to talk with you about God's word. If you need to have a Bible study today, let us know. And we'll come out and study with you this week. If you have a need, please come while we stand, while we sing. Uh,